Hi, I'm Guy Powell, and welcome to the next episode of The Backstory on the Shroud of Turin. If you haven't already done so, please visit guypowell.com and sign up for more episodes. I am the author of the upcoming book, The Only Witness, a historical fiction tracing a possible history of the Shroud over the last two millennia. Today, we're speaking with David Rolfe. He's one of the uh, preeminent researchers on the Shroud of Turin, and we'll be talking about his latest film, Who Can He Be?, which can be found at whocanhebe.com, whocanhebe.com. So David, he is a uh, British Academy Award-winning producer and director with a long career in the British television and film industry. After graduating from London Film School in 1971, he cut his teeth making specialized sequences within major films like The Great Gatsby with Robert Redford and Mia Farrow for Paramount and for other major distributors, and then also documentaries around the world charting subjects as diverse as the rise of the desert kingdoms of the Middle East, the collapse of communism, and the crisis posed by CFCs to the ozone layer. This last film won a major award and paved the way for the banning of the chemical. His Academy Award was for The Silent Witness, an investigation into the Shroud of Turin. This film and subsequent series on the historical Jesus would come to have life-changing benefits for him personally, and now in semi-retirement, he is devoting himself to share the insights his work across all these fields have provided. He is a member of the British Academy of Film and Television Arts, and you can find out more about his career at bfi.org, and we'll be posting the exact link on our website. So David, thank you so much for being here and welcome. Thank you for asking me. Absolutely, it's, uh, it's a very uh, impressive background that you've got there and very, very impressive that you were able to do so well with, the, with your original Shroud documentary. So tell us a little bit about your background on the Shroud. And so what is your backstory on the Shroud of Turin? Well, um, you described me uh, initially there as a Shroud researcher, and, and that would be not completely accurate. I, I had depended on everybody else's research as a filmmaker. Um, yes, I've met most of the people in the last uh, 50 years who have been Shroud researchers, and it's been my honor to meet them and then to find a way of revealing the kinds of things that they, they actually had discovered. So if you like, um, I've been a receptacle of all of their, their hard research and hopefully they'll, they feel that when I've had chance to present it in, in terms of films, then um, it, they're pleased with the results. I mean, John Jackson, for example, in Colorado Springs, I made a complete film um, really dedicated to his work about a decade ago. Uh, and he undoubtedly is somebody who uh, was, was, was in my very first film back in the 70s. And he stuck with it um, uh, for, well, in, for, for many decades now. And you do need to have a, a, a capacity to persevere because um, since the carbon-14 test was done, um, it has been uh, quite difficult to actually penetrate the opprobrium which the Shroud found itself in, but we have to do it somehow. Yes, exactly, and uh, and uh, and there's no question that uh, that uh, that that carbon fourteen dating really affected all of the research that's being done on the Shroud. Yes, and in, in anticipation of, because uh, um, of the last few weeks since the film was released, I've had the opportunity to, to talk and, and do several interviews. And, and in anticipation of our discussion this evening, I was trying to think of something else that, that might take the subject forward. And a thought, and a thought did occur to me. Um, I believe, and I think anyone who actually looks at the subject closely will is likely to come to the same conclusion if they really do uh, approach it with an open mind, that the image on the shroud uh, not only is authentically that of the crucified Jesus, uh, but it is also miraculous. Um, 
once you understand the precise characteristics of the image on the cloth and the fact that it is uniformly, enco uniformly encoded with three-dimensional data, which means that you can extrapolate the complete body. Let me just put this one, this image back up on here in case. Um, Absolutely, no, I, and, uh, and you're right, that image is so, I, I agree with you 100% that it's miraculous, so uh, absolutely. Well, I had the opportunity to do on this film because for, for the first time, which I haven't done on any others, um, the technology uh, has, the CGI technology developed by Hollywood uh, means that basically there's nothing that you can't do. <laughs> uh, I mean, you've only got to see the kind of things that happens in the movies, there is nothing that you can't do and do realistically. And it's achieved by, by brilliant graphic artists uh, doing the artwork and then rendering it up and then you, and using these, uh, the, the, the CGI techniques, animating it and bringing it, all, bringing it all to life. But it starts in the head of the writer and then a director and then a graphic artist and you have all of those things to come and you go to the movies and you see this thing. Well, what well, this is this this is the end sequence of of the new film and what i was able to do in this film was to take the the purely the image of the shroud and scan it um, there's lots of detritus on the image you may you imagine it's 2000 years old so it's picked up lots of wrinkles and cracks and all my graphic artists did was to remove that detritus and leave just the bare data that revealed the image. And then in the climax of the film, having, I mean, it, it took months for them to do this, uh, as you can understand. Uh, what you see here is that image. We, we had a full size facsimile of the shroud in, I, I say in the studio, in fact, I, it's actually in a church because I wanted to do, the, I imagined that I'd have to recreate this in a studio. But because uh, the, the boom in production has been stratospheric, when the time came, I couldn't find a studio that was free. <laughs> and I wondered what on earth I was gonna do. Now I live in a town called Beaconsfield in Buckinghamshire. And about 75 yards from me is St. Michael's Church. Now, as it happens, it's not my church because my church is in another part of Beaconsfield and we go there because that's where I met my wife. So I drive two miles. I could just walk 75 yards across the green to this church. And Sharon, who's the vicar there, is a good friend. But I suddenly realised, hang on a second, a studio? It's a, the other thing is it's a, it's a church without pews. It just has chairs. So once the chairs were out, I would have had to create that impression in a studio. So this sequence, I was actually able to film literally within 75 yards of my house. And, and as I said, it's something which I'm, I'm, I'm proud of all the, the sort of skills of the, of the, art, of the graphic artist and, the, and the, the lighting cameraman and so on in order to do this, because it, 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 it was something that I, I knew would be possible. Um, and could see it in my mind's eye, and it was realized. I think the Italian word for a director is a realizer, someone who realizes something. Mm -hmm. And this this was particularly um, something that that uh, I was I was keen to do, and, and finally had the chance to do it. Yeah, I really liked how you did on that one, where you had then the the three D image of the body hovering over the over the shroud. I thought that. I thought that brought it so much to life and, uh, and that Jesus was, was right there. So uh, kudos to you on, on how you put that together. Well, that's what the shroud makes possible. And if like me, you, you believe that it was, uh, that it's authentic, well, you must also uh, consider the possibility that it was intentionally left for that purpose. We're approaching the 2000th anniversary of the resurrection and i think in that's it's another uh, 10 years or so to be precise but over this next 10 years i'm pretty confident that with the evidence that is now being amassed and 
when I, I finally cracked how to get this particular film out into a wide audience. It has a very niche audience at the moment, and there's a reason for that. Um, but then it, um, uh, hopefully it will actually mark that anniversary in quite a spectacular way. Yeah, that's interesting. I hadn't thought about that as being roughly 10 years from now in, in terms of 33 AD and potentially 33 AD and then uh, 2033. That's a, that is a very interesting date. Maybe hopefully we'll be able to actually see the shroud for real as well during, the, during that year. And, and the, um, you know, the Vatican will allow us to, to visit it. I imagine that would be pretty likely, yes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So uh, you say, and I like the way you put it, uh, in terms of being a, uh, a receptacle for information, not necessarily a researcher, although I will admit if you collect research, you're technically doing research on research. So therefore, I think you get both titles as a researcher as well as a filmmaker. Um, you know, you've, you've spoken with, I'm sure, a lot of uh, researchers. You mentioned John Jackson, and in some of your other interviews, you've mentioned Mark, Max Fry. Maybe uh, tell us a little bit about uh, one or two of the ones that you uh, enjoyed the most and, and learned the most from. Well, uh, when I started, the, the project started, as, as, as I relate in the film, um, I was an atheist. Um, and I, I graduated from film school and, and was eking out a living somehow. And, and when there was only two TV channels, it was difficult to get work. And I, I advertised for ideas that I might just be able to get off the ground and turn into an independent film. And I had a pile this high. Hmm. That came, and uh, frankly, they weren't all that appealing, but one of them stuck out to me big time and that was that came from Ian Wilson who was a, a graduate in history of art and he sent me the negative image of the shroud and uh, on and it was on a medieval cloth and as soon as I saw this thing I thought well this this remarkable image on a on a medieval cloth there's got to be a film in there somewhere and that started off a whole adventure because um, again, it's hard to imagine. Back in this is this was 1976. There was no internet, um, and people operated in silos, and they didn't know about each other. Um, and Ian Wilson had done this wonderful research on uh, that. That not only had he had he been looking at this negative image of of on, on the shroud, but as a hist historian of art. He suddenly realized that there was a source of what we regard as the traditional image of Jesus. I mean, we know from art from the fourth century, from the sixth century onwards, we know exactly all the images of Jesus are as they are. But he also knew that before that time, uh, they, they were random. He was a beardless youth and something that had to have happened so that in the whole and by that time christianity was spread right across asia and into europe uh, there had to be something and there was this key event that is the, the 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 discovery of what we now know as the image of edessa which has its own history and a tradition which goes does go right the way back to the first century and that was that was a great story and i thought that was there's enough there um, but Ian also knew of this, this priest called Rinaldi, who um, had been an altar boy in Turin and gone to New York and set up the Holy Shroud Guild of America. There, took it, he took his love of the shroud with him there. And I said, look, I got, this is a great idea, but and I, I took it to the TV, the two TV channels in the UK then. I said, no one's interested in Rolex, forget it, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll, we won't finance that. <laughs> anyway, Ian said, why don't you go and talk to, to Father Rinaldi in New York? I'd never been to America. I wrote to him and he said, come and see me. And I went to New York for the first time. And that was quite an experience for me in 1976, not just the Big Apple and all the rest of it, but actually meeting up what I've come to realise was a genuine holy man. Um, he, he was charismatic, and I don't mean to say he was, he was Catholic, but he was a totally charismatic person who radiated warmth, 
goodness, wisdom. And it turned out that he had, um, in New York, he had become the center of all these people working in silos, not knowing about each other. They all corresponded in their own way with Rinaldi because he had, he'd set up this Holy Shroud Guild of America. So when I arrived and said, hey, I'm, I, I'm trying to make a film about this, he said, you should talk to so-and-so. You should talk to so-and-so. You, and suddenly, instead of just having Ian Wilson's research, impressive though it was, suddenly I had um, the, the, the work that John Jackson and Eric Jumper had done to reveal the three-dimensional image. I had uh, in, in, in California the most wonderfully um, adept forensic pathologist, Robert Buckley, who'd studied the wounds on the shroud and could do a complete autopsy. Uh, on the image and, and reveal details about crucifixion that we knew nothing about because, thank goodness, crucifixion was stopped in the fourth century when Constantine, Emperor Constantine, became a Christian. Nobody from that moment on knew how to do a crucifixion. We had all sorts of crazy ideas about nails going through the palms of the hands and so on in all these medieval paintings, but no, you try nailing somebody up and holding them by the palms of the hands, it doesn't work. Where is the image on the shroud? It's in the wrists. And every other tiny little detail that you could possibly imagine is revealed in the, in the forensic um, examination that he does in the morgue in Los Angeles. Um, so I, I got very lucky in that sense. And then, of course, Max Fry. Um, and funny enough, I learned about him indirectly from a chance meeting I had with somebody in in an airport, I heard about him. There'd been a report in the Houston Post. I'm told it's one of the biggest, thickest newspapers that you can get, and they just print everything. And, and they printed this story about this Swiss criminologist um, who thought he'd identified some pollens on the shroud. And immediately I flew out to Zurich where he lived to meet him and got him involved too. And sure enough, um, he had been uh, he, he was a very uh, senior um, criminal investigator um, who happened to be a pollen specialist. And for example, when Doug Hammarskjöld, the, the, his, he was, his plane crashed, he was head of the United Nations in the, in the 70s, and they said, mm -hmm. they, I, mm -hmm. I think I've got, you better, better check I've got the right name. I think it was his name. Um, the plane crashed and, and he was the lead investigator. Um, when to find out whether there was foul play involved. That's how prestigious he was. Um, but he lived in Switzerland and he wasn't too far away from Turin and he was asked to be a witness in the in 19, in, sometime in the 1970s to when they were doing some official photography of the shroud. And they thought, we need to have somebody who can attest because, because right from the very beginning when the first photograph was taken in in 1898, um, the photograph, when the, that first negative image was revealed by Secondo Pia with his camera this big, nobody believed him. They thought he'd faked it. And he lived with that suspicion all his life. And he, even though it was eventually confirmed that that negative image was what it was, he'd come to regret ever having taken that first. Photograph. Anyway, the, the church knew about this, and so they made sure that when, when uh, they did do this official photography, they wanted two or three completely prestigious witnesses to be there and observe the whole thing. And Max Fry was there, and just on the off chance, he happened to say to the, to this, while, while I'm here, do you mind if I just take a little bit of scotch tape <laughs> and, and just stick it on the cloth? Uh, it's what I do when I do an investigation because, uh, and they, he was their guest. He, you know, they invited him and they said, "Well, yes, go ahead. Can't do any harm." So he just walked up to the shroud, stuck his scotch tape on it, and then took took them back to his uh, his home on Lake Geneva. And I didn't know this, but Holland's. The X sign of a pollen is virtually indestructible. It lasts for 
for centuries. I mean, you, you it, it, it just, it just is, and each one is different. I mean, it's like a fingerprint. Mm -hmm. And he he started looking in, at, at the pollens on on the shroud, and she, uh, yes, there were there were pollens where, where you'd expect because we know it was held up and displayed in in uh, in Europe and various expositions in the Middle Ages onwards. But then there were Turkish pollens from Constantinople and the part of Asia where this image of Odessa had sprung from. And also there were pollens from Palestine, exclusive to the area between Jericho and the Dead Sea. I mean, that's how exclusive some of these plants are. And then again, that was something else that appeared. And, and if you put all of those different ingredients together, uh, the film had so many, and of course, it's a Jackson's three-dimensional uh, discovery, um, which is revealed in the film, uh, which is really uh, powerful. Um, the film uh, got the success he did, but uh, there's one, one amusing story about Max Fry I can tell you. Um, we were going to do the filming, some filming with him in Turkey, where he where he'd identified some of these pollens. Mm -hmm. and rendezvousing with me and my crew, and we were staying in a hotel in Taksim Square in Istanbul and uh, waiting for him to arrive. And I mean, Turkey was then, still is a bit, but it was a sort of fractious nation and there had been some demonstrations in Taksim Square a few days before, unbeknown to us. And just, be, and just as Max, I was waiting for him in the coffee lounge, in the coffee lounge on the ground floor, overlooking Taksim Square. And I looked up and Max Fry had just walked in and I stood up to, to sort of greet him. And at that moment, a car drove past outside Taksim Square and sprayed the place with a machine gun. Oh because, my. Because the police had used the hotel to fire upon demonstrators oh uh, the my. weekend before. So it had become a target, unbeknown to us. So anyway, I, I remember I remember sort of standing up like this and just as to see to go and greet Max and the, the, the plate glass shattered. And in one move, I just carried on and down and I was under the table. Just an instinctive reaction. But I looked, I was lying on the floor and I looked up. And there was Max Fry. And he was sitting up. I mean, there were, there were a few Americans in there, obviously from Vietnam, and they were on the ground doing this sort of moon over that everybody was, but Max Fry was sat like this, looking around, absolutely wide eyed. And eventually, when, <laughs> when it all calmed down and this had gone and we could finally could greet him properly, we sat down and I said, Max, I said, look, you know, everybody was on the floor, the machine guns had gone, the glass was shattered, and you were, well, let me tell you, he said, all my life I've been an investigator. I've always arrived when it's all over. It's the first time I've ever been there when it's actually happened, and I didn't want to miss anything. <laughs> How funny. <laughs> True story. That is really funny. Um, <laughs> um, well, you know, it's funny, uh, sorry to, to step back a second. Uh, you used uh, Ian Wilson as one of your sources and uh, it, it was his book 20 years ago called The Blood in the Shroud. That was really my inspiration for, for me getting into the shroud and, and, and then now writing the book that I have going. So, uh, and it's so fascinating when you say in the seventies, there was no internet and everybody was working kind of in a silo because nobody knew what was going on whereas now with the internet and podcasts i mean everybody kind of knows immediately that there's something out there and then they can go investigate or investigate further or do some more work or publish some work and uh man have things changed uh over the over the years and I, I, and certainly for the shroud certainly for the better it certainly is i mean you can have too much of a good thing though. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah, <laughs> yes, that's true. Although I don't know if I'm going to stand when I hear bullets flying. I think I'm going to be on the ground just like you. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, well, now, of course, uh, you know, and one of the things that that is so fascinating, you think about uh, Max Fry and him finding these pollens that trace the origins of the uh, travel of the shroud over time from Jerusalem and Palestine and finding, uh, uh, finding pollens there and then over to Odessa and then over to Constantinople and then up to Europe and uh, really providing a, 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 a proof, one proof and one of many, there's now you know, a bunch of different proofs that bring us past that infamous news conference of 1260 to 1390 with the carbon 14 dating and uh so tell us a little bit about that and uh and your impressions about that uh that that happened there well it won't surprise you to know i guess I suppose because in knowing that um we were going to do this interview this evening um and i thought well what what is there perhaps new that, that I can talk about in relation to this whole subject in general? And suddenly a thought occurred to me. And I don't know why it hadn't occurred to me before, because if you follow the logic um, that springs from the shroud and uh, and Christianity and the Bible. Not that I'm a biblical expert, I have to, uh, uh, you know, I, uh, I'm not a biblical expert, but I know enough about the gist of it. Um, the Shroud is, to anybody who approaches it with an open mind, especially now that the, uh, the nature of the image itself is well understood as to what it is, although nobody really has a clue how you could possibly create it. Um, and that it is a miraculous image from which you can create a perfectly recognizable three-dimensional image of the man lying there with all the wounds of the crucifixion. In a way, if you like, it is a kind of ingenious way of reproducing that event 2000 years after it happened. And you have to, you have to ask yourself, was that the plan? You know, um, if, if the actual uh, path that that Jesus's life took, which, which ended in his, his crucifixion and resurrection, was some part of God's plan, uh, then you might anticipate that uh, it would leave something that might have some significance at a future date. Now, um, right up until the carbon-14 test was done, the moment, I mean, the, the fact that the carbon-14 test was done in the first place was because the, the amount of evidence that was contained uh, in the silent witness and then on was that was, was, was so persuasive um, and, and leading to a conclusion that, that anybody with an open mind would make that the shroud is likely to be authentic. It was that momentum that obviously persuaded uh, the, the Vatican to decide, well, wouldn't it be the right thing to do now, now that carbon-14 test, I mean, and, and, until the 80s, you needed, uh, you needed two or three times that amount of material to get enough, to get enough information, enough material to carbon date. And then suddenly you just needed, with a new IMS process, you needed that. And so it's not surprising that um, the Vatican said, right, let's, let's submit 
Bushmel to a carbon-14 test. In the, in the face of all the evidence that we have, um, uh, we can be pretty confident of the result. And will that not be a good thing? Uh, I mean, they may have, they may have overlooked the path. There's a line in the Bible that says something like, do not put the Lord thy God to the test, I seem to remember. Mm -hmm. And uh, that is something that they might rue in the end, because obviously uh, it, things turned out badly. But they assumed, of course, that in, in doing that, and especially uh, appointing some, an organization as august as the British Museum uh, to oversee the whole thing, that um, it was all in good hands and, and they, could, you know, they could be seen, could, the last thing they could be seen to be is to be involved in any way, manipulated. But it was only, basically only really today. And uh, it just occurred to me that obviously in the world that's depicted in the Bible is dualist. There's good and evil. Mm. Um, and uh, it's not surprising if you've got something which is on the cusp of actually validating everything that, that Christians have believed since the first disciples 2,000 years ago. In a dualist world where evil exists, there will be something, or dare I say, somebody, who, whoever they are motivated and wherever the source of that motivation comes from, has the intent to stop that happening. Because I think we can all safely assume that had that carbon-14 test given a 2,000-year date, the world will be a different place to what it is now. I live in the United Kingdom. And I'm an, when I became a Christian, I became an Anglican. Our church has lost its confidence. It... It does its best, but do you get, do you get from the church leadership? Do you get it brave enough to condemn things which it knows are really wrong and evil and bad for society? I mean, our government is just about to budget 78 billion pounds over the next five years to pay for children that do not have proper homes. Mm. And nobody, not even the church, is, is brave enough now, willing enough to say, well, back in the day when we did have confidence, we said there was shame. We said that illegitimacy was not a good thing and that a family ideally should have solvent parents able to ensure that they could bring their children up. But we live in a world now where people are frightened to say such things. And uh, because anything goes. And I don't think the world would be in that place today had that carbon-14 test gone in a different way. Well, I think, uh, and to your point, um, uh, you know, I, I don't know, evil versus good, but uh, certainly um, believing versus not believing uh, if you have a cloth that just continues to be proven that the resurrection is true, the resurrection is true, the miracle of the resurrection, it would be very difficult to be a non-believer. And uh, uh, so even if you, uh, you know, if you are a believer, you don't necessarily, you don't really need to have the cloth to, to uh, prove to yourself that, that, that he, you know, that Christ died and was resurrected. But, um, you know, if you're a non-believer and you see that there was a miracle, then there's really a, uh, it's very hard in your mind to say, well, wait a minute now, that, that there's something that happened there. And why am I, you know, how can, how can my world beliefs be right if that miracle actually took place and what the church has been preaching for the last 2000 years is true. 
So, uh, I, um, and I think you make that uh, point in in some of your interviews as well as, uh, and maybe even in the in the movie, where if it is true and if it is proven true and if the radiocarbon dating was true, then uh, the non-believers then have a real problem with their with their outlook of their of their whole lives. That's right, and uh, and if you if you like the the evil force in the world. Uh, would seek to uh, to make that happen, and uh, that's the the other side um, of of this this equation. And um, the uh, I've, it is it is a really tricky area to go in, but I I think I came across that force, um, and of course, as you'd expect, when I first came across it, it posed as the opposite. It posed as something that was entirely um, supportive and favourite, but that was an entirely, it was a subterfuge. Mm. Um, and uh, somebody who ultimately found themselves, or put it this way, used the charms that they had uh, to get to the very heart of the, of the subject, to be present, in fact, actually to be the, the person who actually orchestrated most to orchestrate the carbon-14 test happening and actually was present uh, for it and whose only motive, as is now known, was to show that the shroud was a fake. Now, um, I, I, I'm just, I, as you know, I'm, I have up until now been the editor of the British Society for the Turing Shroud. It's been the last five or six years. I'm retiring from that now, um, partly because I, I want to spend what time I have trying to, to ensure that my latest film reaches the widest possible audience. And I'm, we've got a great team at the British Society. You, I know you've interviewed Brenda mm -hmm. uh, recently. Um, who, Pam Moon, and I've got a couple others on the on the list. Uh, you, there's a whole uh, there's a whole group of people there that are just really uh you know really understand uh, a lot of the uh the aspects of the shroud and i'm looking forward to talking with them as well well if, if there's if there's anybody who watches this interview who really um can I, if, if i can recommend that the bsts newsletter i'm hopefully going to give um yep. it's, av it's available online you can have a printed version of it but in in the issue in, in what was my last issue as editor which comes out in a couple of weeks time um, I'm, I'm going to set down uh, in detail what we've just been uh, talking about and, and, and reveal what I know of the forces that were at work uh, and have created the situation that we now find ourselves in. You know, one thing as you were talking and, you know, you're talking about this dualist nature, uh, and I believe it's the same in, in England, is in in the in the court of law you have it's adversarial you've got one side the prosecution and you've got one side the defense and they basically uh present then their arguments as best they can and then whoever has hopefully the best arguments then either you know wins the jury or then you know or the worst arguments they lose or what have you but it's interesting that the carbon 14 dating as and I'll use your words, the injustice that it, it perpetrated actually possibly was a positive for the shroud overall, because if the carbon 14 dating wasn't controversial, then all of this other stuff and all of this other research that's going on may not have taken place or may not have taken place as quickly as it did to refute what that carbon 14 dating actually delivered. And so maybe, you know, maybe I'm looking for a silver lining, but maybe it actually helped because it is kind of an adversarial. You either think it's true or it's not true. It's authentic or it's not authentic. And here we have uh, this one proof or this one test that may have, may have uh, you know, found that it was 1260 to 1390. And then we have tens and tens of other tests that are now saying, no, 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 no. Every one of these other tests come out right and therefore, we're going to refute that kind of in an adversarial system. So maybe that's where that dualist uh, concept can be taken as well. Well, and, and also very generously, 
you are assuming that the majority of people have an open mind. Um, but I don't think they do. I think there is a, the, uh, and in some ways, the church has only itself to blame for, for, for some aspects of this. But a lot of the, and I use this word loosely, the intelligentsia, um, uh, associate the, the traditional uh, church with history. Um, and it's a shame that the church didn't do itself many favours. It got involved in its own scandals. Um, in uh, my office, she used to look over um, when I was working in, in, in television on the South Bank in London, used to look over Blackfriars Bridge. Well, it was the, um, the banker of the Vatican was found hanging by his neck from Blackfriars Bridge. Mm. Um, there, were, there were financial scandals. Uh, and we know that the church um, uh, allowed uh, known paedophile priests to continue in their uh, roles. They just moved them around. Yeah. And so the church really must take some of the responsibility for a lot of people thinking, we don't want to go back to that world. Um, and if, if the shroud is genuine, suddenly, you know, the, the, the church is going to be reinforced. And we look what happened last time. Yep. So the, the culture in which we live um, is not something and, uh, that is favourable for it. And the other thing is, of course, is because the British Museum and Oxford University were such bastions of academic respectability, mm. um, and no academic is ever going to take the risk of standing up for the Turing Shroud for, for two reasons. First of all, what do they know? In order to study it, you've got to spend years and they're busy doing other things. And they've got that wonderful headline. Some medieval forger just faked it up and flogged it from the mouth of the head of the Oxford Radiocarbon Unit. They don't need anything else. So no matter what you lay before them and say, why don't you take a look? Yep. I've got no time. I'm not interested. So that's another major factor which, which, which restricts the Shroud's uh, ability to, um, to regain, for want of another word, respect. Well, and that I agreed uh, with that. And that, that definitely cost uh, Shroud research and the uh, and everything surrounding it probably at least three decades, if not even, if not more. And, uh, uh, and it's only really recently that it seems like the, uh, you know, that there is a lot more coming out about the Shroud and it may be that I'm just seeing it because I'm so involved in it, but it just seems like there's more going on. The, 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 what you say is absolutely right. The, um, the, for those people who get it, the sense of frustration that the current situation evokes uh, has created just, I mean, enormous amounts of, of the most uh, wonderful uh, research from just about every single discipline you can imagine. Uh, I'm sure like you, I mean, I, I subscribe to that um, uh, service that publishes papers. Um, Academia.edu. Yeah, absolutely. And you've only got to put Shroud of Turin in there. And yeah. yeah. Um, and it is, it, for those people who, who get it, it is a, it is a source of, of complete fascination. And I, and I in, in a sense, pity is not the right word, but for somebody who hasn't opened themselves up in order to look at it closely, is actually missing something. Because when you turn on the TV, and they're wonderful movies. And they're all fantasies. <laughs> you know, mm. and they have special effects people creating things and they're entertaining. But in the Shroud, you have something which doesn't involve the, the Hollywood's special effects teams to actually, it actually is its own story. And uh, although Hollywood did give it its greatest title and the greatest story ever told, um, and because, uh, of course, that's what it is. Yeah, but that was also uh, before the uh, 
<laughs> I think that was before the carbon 14. Oh, rating. absolutely. <laughs> a, lo a long time before. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Well, and, and now, even if there was a, uh, my wife likes to watch 60 Minutes. I don't know if you have that over there, but anyway, it's basically a news program. And even if you were to get a news program to actually spend an hour on the shroud, they would always have to couch it in, you know, and well, it could, it might not be possible. They never really want to, even though they might talk about, you know, what you believe the facts are and what I believe the facts are, they'll always try and not be a hundred percent behind it. And, and that definitely is a change in the culture uh, overall. I think in the, you know, it, going back to the, the pre uh, carbon 14 dating and even earlier in the sixties and whatever, uh, you would never get that. You would be, you know, you would, I, I think you would have much more of an open-minded press that would be talking about it. Well, uh, yes, and I, I, I agree with what you say, but we also have to remember that uh, if belief in the resurrection and Christianity was as easy as two plus two, um, it wouldn't be the same as something that ultimately you have to take a leap of faith in. Yeah. Um, and because that's what anybody who is a Christian and uh, goes to church and goes on bended knee and, and prays to the Lord, yeah. Yeah. They, they are taking an act of faith in, in doing that. And it would mean nothing if if it was the equivalent to say being in a totalitarian regime when people say this is what you've got to do because it's the only way there are a million ways out there and you can choose which it is and by and large christians who choose to do that have taken a leap of faith yep yep and then um uh and then you think back on uh mm -hmm. apostle thomas and he says uh you know, I, I want to put my fingers in the wounds and, uh, and I won't believe until I feel it. And, uh, and that, you know, seeing is believing uh, versus not seeing and yet believing and, and, and uh, that whole part of the doubting Thomas story and, the, uh, and then Jesus answer to that is, is kind of what you're talking about. But anyway, we're coming close to the, the end of our time. So what do you think is the next big thing for the shroud? Well, uh, Turin has a new archbishop. Um, it, for the last two or three years, uh, the outgoing archbishop, um, partly because he was outgoing and partly because he was um, getting on a bit, um, that whole area has, uh, the shred, nothing much has been happening um, in, in that field now. But there is a very active um, shroud uh, group in, in Turin, obviously. Around who I'm sure uh, now that there is a new archbishop, hopefully given some impetus by the Who Can He Be film, which is, you know, it's available around the world in eight or nine languages and, you know, it's slowly getting out there. In the, in the beginning was the word and the word was made flesh and, and people are telling each other about it. Have you seen this film about it? Especially that last part. And, and so I'm, I'm optimistic um, that, that, that things will go ultimately in, in the right direction. Well, uh, and with that, uh, I hope so too. I uh, thank you so much. And, um, and, uh, and I, I think the, you know, I, certainly on our side and with me, I'm gonna promote it as much as I can. Uh, I felt the movie was really spot on and uh, and for those people that want more information, it's who can it who can he be dot com who can he be dot com, and I'll have links to that as well from my website guy or powell guy powell dot com, and otherwise, uh, uh, David, thank you so much. Uh, you brought up a couple of very interesting topics, and <laughs> and definitely your story with Max Fry is uh, that's an original. <laughs> I really like that. Well, thank you for making this possible. Absolutely. So, uh, and thank you and everyone, please stay tuned for other videos in this series of the backstory on the Shroud of Turin. Please visit my site, guypowell.com for more ep episodes. And if you like this one, please rate it, rate it with uh, five stars. 
David, thank you so much. Bye-bye.